BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 240, Fight FDA Restrictions on Hormone Pellets. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. This week, we would like to make all of you aware of something that's very, very important for those of you who either get hormone replacement uh, pellets in particular uh, or have friends and relatives that get them. There is a challenge before the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, that is seeking to restrict the ability of compounding pharmacies to ship their product interstate. Uh, And that creates a lot of problems for people who get hormone replacement pellets Mm -hmm. of all kinds for a lot of reasons. And so today we're going to talk about that because what we want you to do, if you are a recipient or a beneficiary of this type of medical intervention, you have to be an advocate for yourself and you have to, to do what you can do to fight these insurgent actions that want to inhibit, restrict, limit your free capacity to get medicine that helps you. Uh, The FDA is a regulatory agent agency that makes decisions that make things available to us or restricted to us on a whole range of things and they're constantly being um, invited to consider changes and there is an invested in place industry that wants to restrict competition so they can maintain their own money flow. Uh, So we want you to know this information and we hope that you will go to the the website, the link that is posted on the summary of this podcast and click on that link and put some comments in the comment section that comes up on that link that will be submitted to the FDA directly as it considers this request to inhibit the legal ability of uh, compounding pharmacies to ship their products across state lines. And it's, that's particularly a concern of Dr. Moffins because... <clears throat> Because I've used the same pharmacy. Which are not in Missouri. Which two is pharmacies. One, one for 13 years. And actually before that, before I even did pellets, I ordered pres- prescriptions for my patients mm-hmm. uh, from them. And uh, they're in they're two states over. And there's another pharmacy in the same state. These pharmacies have the most experience making hormone pellets. Right. They make them routinely, consistently. I have never had a problem. There's never been any kind of issue in any of my patients, thousands and thousands of patients, for 13 years. And I would never change pharmacies, ever, unless I had to because of a governmental restriction. And then I would be offering an inferior uh, an inferior product. I've tried pellets myself because I'm the guinea pig, and my employees have tried them um, from pharmacies within the state. Right. That say, oh, we can do. This we can do this, cheaper, and we can do it cheaper, and, and you can get yeah. it faster, and all that kind of stuff. I've tried it, and I've had terrible side effects uh-huh. personally. Right. My employees have as well, and we're like. No, we because aren't of doing that. Consistencies in the manufacturing because process. of how they made them and their inexperience, and you can't just go. I mean, compounding is an art. It's right. it's not really. I mean, it's an art and a science. Right. So you have to have a consistent way of making things. You have to have a, a a sterile room. You have to. I mean, you have to have a certain compression that puts them together because the compression determines how fast they dissolve. Right. And so. That's very how, how important. Densely compressed they how are. densely compressed the powder is mm-hmm. so that they can dissolve at the same time. Like one month they could dissolve fast and the next month they could dissolve slow. Right. But basically we have we use testosterone and estradiol powder made from yams and soy and that powder is then compacted into a pellet of a exact size right. that has to have the exact compression. Right. And then has to be sterile, has to have a gamma radiation sterility. So they put it into gamma radiation for sterile, sterilization, which is a very expensive machine, which most pharmacies, small pharmacies, can't possibly use. So basically, they'd be effectively putting me out of the very successful and very necessary practice of delivering hormone replacement with pellets. Right. It's the best way to deliver them. Right. And I would, I, I don't know what I would 
do if I couldn't get the pellets from the pharmacies that I get them from. And that means your patients don't know what they would do. Right. I so mean, unless they advocate for your ability to continue to get these from an out-of-state provider so that the government doesn't restrict it. Yeah. I mean, this is this is like taking your freedom away. They don't restrict any other pharmacies. Mm -hmm. They don't restrict, they don't restrict, you know, you uh, buying a anything from another state. We're a United States right. and we're based on freedom. Well, they have some restrictions and they about are, buying international. And they're paid, well, but, but that's and they, I don't think yeah. that's necessarily appropriate either. Right. Yet, this is the United States. Interstate commerce, this is not how, you, you don't restrict interstate com commerce. We're not separate it was separate countries. We are the United States. We well, should be able to buy and sell everything within the United States. But if they restrict it, one of the things that happened, I mean, whether they should The question it or is, not, why are they doing it? Okay. I think that's really the most important question. The FDA is paid by your tax dollars and mine. Mm -hmm. They are supposed to be looking out for us. There is no reason for this to happen. Well, but there's an argument that is made by the mainstream pharmaceutical companies. Because they won't make as bio, much money. That, that compounding pharmacies don't have the right sterile conditions or the right supervisory conditions, that they're not audited in the same ways. Or, but they're, they are. They're, they're, well, that's the argument that's made. Because the FDA the, is all over you, them and always reviewing them, and they pass. So how could I, how, why would I not be able to get it? Well, and not only the FDA, but every state has its own state Laws, laws right. regarding medicines and the distributions mm -hmm. and manufacturing of medicines and so on. And they have investigatory bodies that go in and check out the quality of the mm -hmm. conditions of manufacture. But there was a pharmacy about a year and a half ago that made headlines internationally right. because they had and it was a small pharmacy. Yeah, on the east coast. Yeah, uh, they had unsterile conditions right. and they produced some bad drugs. But they were one compounding pharmacy, exactly. and. The FDA had failed to go in and evaluate them. They were set up. They were supposed to be evaluated. And the FDA didn't, didn't do, do it. They yeah. didn't do their job. So they don't do their job. So we're going to pay the price. Right. Because this pharmacy, this little pharmacy, sent all over the country and people were hurt. So if you use the same logic for everything in America, mm -hmm. first car crash that kills somebody or hurts somebody, no more cars. Okay? First plane that goes down, no more flight. I mean, if that's how you're going to do America, then we are going to be, we're going to be living in cabins and we're well, going to be growing our own food and not able to leave the state. It's an overly controlled or overly parentified approach to government. It's kind of like my mother's philosophy. My, my mother's philosophy, whenever I would ask to do something, was the first round answer was always no. <laughs> So but if the government is, is in the position of having the authority to say no, then it a lot of people just go, oh, okay, and go away. True. I mean, yeah. And quietly die. But the, <laughs> the, the only reason I can imagine, this this doesn't pr propose a, a health hazard. Right. And if it's just like if you take if you take 100 doctors, five of them won't be qualified. Right. So those are the five that should not be practicing medicine. But the other 95. But the other 95 should. Right. And are good at it. So why would you take, uh, make a blanket law instead of just taking out the pharmacies that aren't following are FDA guidelines? I always said that about teachers. You know, I was a school teacher for a lot of years and would get frustrated when they'd make global statements about good teachers and bad teachers. And my, my philosophy was always get rid of the bad ones. Right. We know who they are. We all know. The kids know. The parents know. The teachers know. The administration is like, no, we have these standards that has to apply to everybody. Almost everybody that's listening has has either in their in their world they know this philosophy the right. philosophy of there are people that don't do their job they shouldn't have a job in that area but something protects them but something protects them and keeps them there so let's flip the conversation for a minute there are good things good services good outcomes that occur because compounding pharmacies that have the capacity for multi-state distribution exist. Mm -hmm. For instance, when there are drug shortages. Right. And the FDA is not going to instruct that a pharmaceutical manufacture a particular drug that's in need because sometimes those drugs don't make the money for the pharmacy, so they don't make them. There's lots of reasons. The, pharma the pharmaceutical company doesn't make orphan drugs, like which means drugs for diseases that have a small number of people right. but are deadly. And so 
they don't make those those medications because they're approved by the FDA, but they can't, they say, we don't make enough money. Right. So then compounding pharmacies step in and attempt to make whatever that drug is uh-huh. for, for that patient be, because they can and they can do it with less expense mm-hmm. So, or a similar drug. So then that's one way they step in. So they're really necessary, especially the big pharmacies. We had a B12 shortage injectable b12 there are people in every nursing home in america who get injectable b12 at least every month it keeps them from having numb legs it it helps neuropathies it helps them think it's it is essential so b12 is one of the one of the things it's a vitamin okay it's not a it's not a big drug it's inexpensive comes in a vial that we give either the patient gives or we give in the office and all of a sudden there was none available right for no apparent reason so we went to the compounding pharmacies they made it for us so that we could give this same drug to our patients it wasn't any more or less expensive, but they made it for us. Well, my son takes an ADD drug, mm-hmm. attention deficit disorder, and periodically, episodically, we are informed by the pharmacies that there's a shortage of this drug because the FDA has restricted the volume that they can produce. So they think that if they don't produce it, people won't need it. So they do this with several different drugs. Right. So this is one that of the they ways. They politically decide, oh, people don't need this, or doctors are over-prescribing this, and so and they're we'll not restrict doctors it in the food chain. And they're not doctors, but they're making this economic decision. Uh, and or it health costs decision. the country too much, so we're not going to make this anymore. Right. I mean, that's yeah. really what it comes down to now that we have semi-socialized medicine. That somebody's making those economic decisions. Right. Right. But but another way the pharmacies, these compound, big compounding pharmacies, step in. Well, um, three years ago, when we had the swine flu epidemic, they uh, all of a sudden nobody could get their Armour thyroid, which is pig thyroid, and they use it. When, it's usually a woman's. It does better with women, but many men take it as well. But we couldn't find it. All of us, no one told us anything. No one, the, no, the FDA didn't send us anything. We didn't see any. We didn't get a letter. All of a sudden, all our patients are calling us trying to find. Um, Armor thyroid, and since we didn't know what was behind it at the time, we um, sent them to compounding pharmacies, and they made up a combination of thyroid T3, T4 that was just like the Armor thyroid, and so they could keep using that until it came back online. But the reason it came, it went offline, which isn't really common knowledge, is that. The government came in, and I don't know what you call it when you just take away property or or, or take over, confiscated all the pigs that were being used, medical pigs, which are fed differently than regular pigs, and they use their valves and everything else. I guess there must have been a valve shortage, too. And they used them for the swine flu vaccine. They injected them and with that, used their, an- their antibodies, and then... That's how they used them. Then, of course, they slaughtered them. Yes. But, but that was what they did with the pigs that were making the armor thyroid. So the government started the problem, didn't give us a solution. We got a solution through the compounding pharmacies. And this is, I mean, these are just examples. This happens all the time in other in other. It just goes to prove the old adage that even in a democracy, specialties. some pigs are more equal than other pigs. <laughs> So, so the government um, took the healthy pigs, the yes. medical pigs, yeah, the medical used pigs them for their, their agenda, purpose. And everybody else who was benefiting from those that agenda was just dropped off. But but in, in business and in families and in any other decision-making group, if you're going to take something away over here so that somebody can't get what they need, you provide it somewhere else. They don't care about that. They didn't do that. It was an emergency, so they didn't do that. Well, and another argument that you make. Thyroid's that, life-giving. Yes. <laughs> Another argument that you make with regard to this that sometimes falls on deaf ears is that one of the primary benefits of compounding pharmacies producing these hormones in pellet form is that it offsets the medical industry's sexual preference for treating things that men have and ignoring things that women have. Right. And men and women both have a medical need for testosterone. 
Men are allowed to get it with prescriptions mm-hmm. approved by the FDA in several different forms. There is no approved form for women. And women don't do well taking the men's form. And, and women don't do well taking the men's form. And so the compounding pharmacies have generated a product at the request of physicians like yourself mm-hmm. to provide this capacity to women so that they can get the benefit that they need. And the government has sort of ignored all of that. But because the the numbers are growing and more people are getting it, Big Pharma is, is looking at it and saying, oh, maybe the government should restrict that. So our tax dollars are being used. 50% of us are women to be so that we can be discriminated against. I mean, that's huge. And the I mean the biggest group of people who have are left to be in the discriminatory category in medicine are women. So, so this we, is huge. It I is mean, huge. this and is the only way we can get what we need because they won't offer it to us. They don't have anything for there us. There are political and economic and religious agendas that people have that say women shouldn't have sex drives. Sex. Uh, <laughs> sex uh, and shouldn't have the same consideration for these issues that men have. We're still in Victorian England here. <laughs> so, so in summary, these are the things that we would like for you to consider. We would like for you to look at the link and click on it that's, that accompanies the summary of this podcast. We would like for you, when you get to that link, to make these points to the government. One, restriction of Compounding pharmacies, interstate capacity is a restriction of your freedom to get what you need that's been proven to work at your best cost. It's the most economic option for you, and that cost will go up if there are those restrictions, and that will cost you. Or you won't that, be able to get it. <laughs> that there's a, uh, a sexual discrimination that's involved if you're female, or if the person that you know who needs these prescriptions is female, that you don't want to have a political decision made about, uh, and that the compounding pharmacies have long been a buffer against crisis and short-term shortages that the big pharmacies are not capable of taking care of. And if we restrict that, it reduces our safety net as a nation for our ability to have good health. So if you could make, in your own words, comments relative to those concepts, Hopefully, those messages in volume will impact the FDA decision-making process and retain for you your right to get those medicines from the compounding pharmacies on an interstate basis. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BiobalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BiobalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at BrettNewcomb.com.